In his will, Muhammad Atta said he wanted no women at his funeral, no women at his grave. Only, he said, good Muslims. To the suicide pilot of September 11th, that meant men. Atta was a man who, like the Taliban, used Islam to justify his fear and hatred of women. It's men like these who've convinced many in the West that Islam itself is a religion which hates and oppresses women. But I want to challenge that view. I'm going to travel across the Islamic world to ask whether a devout Muslim woman can find freedom and equality. I was born and brought up in Britain as a Muslim and have watched the rise of fundamentalist Islam with bewilderment. As a journalist, I reported on its growth. As a feminist, I questioned whether it was still a faith I could call my own. I want to know if the true teachings of Islam have been distorted, if men really are allowed to beat their wives, if Islam really promotes the stoning to death of women. At the heart of my investigation is the veil. To some, it's the uniform of oppression. I want to find out why, for many millions of women, it's become a powerful symbol of political liberation. The greatest appeal of Islam, of submission to Allah, is that it is totally without gender. Allah is not a father, like the Christian God. Both women and men pray in exactly the same way. There's no hierarchy of bishops and priests. In fact, the first convert to Islam was a woman, Muhammad's first wife. But the moment you step outside the home into the public space of the street and the mosque, women are almost invisible. I was about nine when I first went into a mosque. It was just like this the first time, was being crowded up here, all the women up here, and you realise there's this huge space down there and only the men are allowed. I've never, ever been on the main floor of a mosque before. I was always up there, always trying to get the proper picture of what it looked like, and this is, this is, it feels like it was always meant to be. I do remember talking to my dad about it afterwards and saying it was, you know, it was really quite a horrible experience in the women's gallery, not what I expected at all. Even then, when I was, you know, nine years old, it just didn't seem fair. But at least my generation didn't have to wear the veil. It seemed archaic. Now, girls much younger than me are taking it by choice. Why is it so important to them now? 25 years ago, when I started, you know, learning to read the Quran and going to the mosque, um, it never occurred to me that you'd be in a situation where second and third generation immigrants like myself would be choosing to wear a more strict form of the veil than their parents. My generation was told it wasn't in the Quran but many now feel they have to wear it. The first Friday of Ramadan, Whitechapel Market in London's East End and the heart of a large Muslim community. Here, it struck me that I was practically the only one not wearing a veil. Do you ever feel that because you were dressed the way you do that you get given any grief on the street? I'm a stare so badly. <laughs> <laughs> As if it's horrible. What kind of people stare at you? <laughs> Any people. Non-Muslim, really. Exactly. Yeah. Men look at us, isn't it? Yeah, men look at us. Some of our mums wear the, like, the thing, hijab and this, but they don't wear the niqab. Right. How, do they, how does your mum feel about you wearing the niqab, then? Proud. <laughs> this is a good thing to wear it. <laughs> I find it all very strange. They are just schoolgirls. But one of them said she feels naked without her hijab. Feminists of my generation have always fought for the right to dress as they please, but to me it's a shock that these girls should choose to look like this. I want to find out why young women born and brought up in this country are interpreting their religion in this way. Shaista, Sidra, Salwa and Umama are all students at university in Birmingham. Um, some of you perhaps have been wearing it for, uh, you know, not such a long time. Do you not find that actually 
in a weird way, it draws more attention initially. What you see is like that's what you're judged on. They don't see yeah. that you know, they don't judge you on your mind or yeah. you know how intellectual you may be, yeah. your personality. The hijab itself, it's a covering. It lexically comes from the word to cover. And that's the beauty of it, but it doesn't cover the mind, it allows the mind to work on its that's own it. terms. But so you're more than an image. When I was growing up, I knew plenty of Muslim girls, but none of us ever wore the hijab. And, and I'm just interested why there seems an interest in, in rediscovering this. I feel this. that this society has progressed materially, yet spiritually they haven't. And I think looking around you, you think everything is so superficial, the Western society, all they lust for is power. And it's just greeding us. It's all me, 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 and no one. Can... These friends all seem to reject Western culture. They feel degraded by its obsession with sex. When I adopted it um, three years ago, I was practically the only one, and especially among the young generation. One could argue it might make life difficult for you, depending on what you choose to do after university. I mean, there'd be certain jobs. I mean, just to give an example, if you're doing my job, I couldn't imagine you being a newsreader, wearing the full niqab. There's the free society, the society that judges on merit and not on image. I mean, if I'm an individual who's doing it and out of belief, out of choice, out of conviction, nobody should have a problem with that, as long as I'm not imposing it on others, as long as there's a balance. For them, this is not just a passing fad. Their dress may seem surprising, but they're at that age when young women form their identities partly through deliberately shocking appearance. They seem to sort of feel no connection between the choices they'd made and the fact that so many women who are born Muslim have no choice and are forced to dress that way. It was like it's not enough to live a Muslim life, you have to show it. And I don't understand that. I don't see that that's essential. I just thought they did seem somehow to be disconnected from the country they lived in. It's hard for a woman like me to understand the appeal of so strict, so confining a version of Islam, especially to young, educated British Muslims. It seemed as political as anything else, a strong statement of identity. But then the rise of the modern Islamist movement has always been political, right from 1979 and the revolution in Iran. What happened here inspired fundamentalists across the world. This is where most of us first saw the veil as a powerful symbol on the streets. It's the right place to start asking questions. After 25 years under the rule of the Ayatollahs, I wondered how this forbidding, politicized Islam was treating the mothers and daughters of the revolution. I have come to meet nine-year-old Farzana. It's the evening before a very important day in her life as a Muslim girl. Tomorrow, she will be officially initiated into the wearing of a hijab. And from this day on, she will be obliged to cover up when in public. Very nice. Now you have to observe the basics of Islam and do whatever God would like you to do. Can you ask how she feels wearing it for the first time? Kush, yes. <laughs> what will she be doing now that she is nine that she didn't have to do before? Before the age of puberty, a girl is free to do as she wishes around men. Once she has come of age, she is obliged to observe all the religious duties expected at this age. She has to say her prayers. She has to fast and observe all the religious duties that are expected of her. Above all, she has to cover up. Some of Rizana's personal freedoms will be curtailed. She will no longer be able to play in the streets, but restricted to her apartment courtyard. Rizana will also not be allowed to go to the shop unaccompanied. This is to protect her honor as a young woman. Actually, we like a hijab. We have chosen to be covered up and no one is forcing us. Women who don't observe the full hijab are influenced by Western cultures. And if this hadn't influenced them, then I believe they too would wear the full hijab.
the first time many people in the West will have seen the veil was in the form of the all-enveloping Chador. It was perhaps the most potent symbol of the revolution in Iran. In fact, it symbolizes defiance against the rule of the Shah, who forcibly westernized Iran, banning veils, even forbidding pilgrims from going to Mecca. The British and the Americans kept him in power, the politics of oil. While the liberated middle classes chose to dress this way, to the majority of Iranians, Western culture was resented as the imposition of the oppressor. When the revolution came, Ayatollah Khomeini said, Islam lived amongst the people as if it were a stranger. We have completely forgotten our identity. Reclaiming Iran, and crucially its women from alien ideals, lay at the heart of his Islamic Republic. I wanted to know how women experience life under the Chador now. In Tehran, the veil has shrunk to a discreet headscarf. Were these women still full of the religious fervor we saw on the streets all those years ago? Rizana's taklif ceremony is unique to Iran. It's religious, but it is organized by the state, and it is held in a school rather than a mosque. The major impact is that overnight these girls feel like grown-ups, and this gives them self-confidence, self-worth, and a sense of duty and responsibility to observe all the Islamic rituals expected of them. This ritual seemed comparable to the Catholic ceremony of First Holy Communion, initiating children into a spiritual life. The difference is that little girls like Farzana will have to wear this for the rest of their lives. What struck me watching Farzana and her classmates was how eager they were, aged just nine, to grow up and by taking the veil, take on the role of women. But on the other side of Tehran, I met another family who questioned the state's imposition of religion on their lives. This is nine-year-old Pantea and her family. They are typical middle-class professionals working in computers and teaching. Unlike Ferzana's family, their priorities are different. They want their daughters to have a broader education. <laughs> I would like my daughters to be strong, to withstand difficulties, and be strong enough to defend their own rights and not to be weak women. Pantea's granny and aunt live downstairs, and granny remembers when things were different before the revolution. <laughs> There was no hijab in my day, it just didn't exist. The state didn't want us to wear it. I would show my hair and used to send my daughters to school with their hair done really nicely with ribbons. In my time, we didn't have to wear hijab. If we wore it, the police would tear it off. Suddenly, Pante's granny, embarrassed, remembers that she has forgotten to wear her hijab for the camera. <laughs> okay. 
I personally think that a girl of nine is still a child and too young to wear a hijab. For example, up to the day before they turn nine, girls are allowed to play with their male cousins and relatives. Then suddenly they realize that they can no longer play with them anymore and that they have to be all covered up in front of them. I don't think it's fair for them to be separated out, even though all they do with each other is play some innocent childish games. Thanks to our parents, we were brought up the same as our brother. My parents saw us as equal. You see, there is a tendency all over the world to impose one's power and take advantage of the weak or the minority. But for a state to regulate such behavior as conventional practice is quite unacceptable. This is brave talk in a theocratic state still effectively run by the Ayatollahs. I have every respect for people who want to practice Islam, but I prefer to live in a state where the rule of law is in place, because what we have doesn't empower me, it weakens me. Does the Quran explicitly require the wearing of the veil? The obvious answer is to go back to the original text, because to Muslims, it's the unaltered word of Allah, and ultimately the source of all Islamic life. There's actually no reference to it as such in the Quran. Um, there's two verses which talk specifically about the way men as well as women should dress. It's um, Surah 24, um, verses 30 and 31. Say to the believing men that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty. That will make for greater purity for them. And God is well acquainted with all that they do. And say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty, that they should not display their beauty and ornaments, except what must ordinarily appear thereof, that they should draw their veils over their bosoms and not display their beauty, except to their husbands, their fathers, and it runs through a list of uh, appropriate people. There are seven references to the word hijab, we found, but they're never meant um, in terms of a veil. The custom of veiling women didn't begin until about three generations after the Prophet's death, when ironically Muslims began to copy the Christians of Byzantium and the Zoroastrians of Persia. And now, to veil or not to veil comes down to how you interpret the phrase, not display your beauty. Liberals say it means covering your sexual parts. Others say it means covering your hair. While fundamentalists like the Saudi Wahhabis believe face and hands should be hidden as well. The veil has more recently become a symbol of Islamic authenticity because of its relation to the Prophet. There's only one reference which is in connection with women, and that's in connection with the Prophet's wives. Um, when it talks about um, if people want to address the wives, that they should address them from behind a partition. And it's been suggested to me that that's more to do with a time when the Prophet and his family were almost under siege from followers, and it was a way of guarding their privacy. And the onus was on people coming to see them to be hidden, rather than the women themselves to be hidden from them. So there appears to be no specific requirement in the Quran to wear the veil, but tell that to the mullahs. I've come to Zanan magazine, which is this weekly women's magazine here in Tehran, um, to talk to uh, one of the reporters, find out the kind of stories they do, and get a sense of what the issues are for women here in Tehran. And uh, I think it's their editorial meeting, so I'm going to sit in on it. Established in 1991, Zanan was the first magazine with an openly feminist agenda. For these women, the Islamic Revolution was supposed to liberate, not suppress them. They articulate their demands through Islam and not through Western feminism, actively attempting to reinterpret the Quran and reclaim rights for women, both at work and in the home. But by tackling issues like male domestic violence and honor killings, they have got into trouble with the authorities. There have been problems at times, but in general, I would say, we have had more problems with the conventional culture we live in as opposed to the problems with authorities and all the traditional perspectives of male-dominant society and the way it portrays women. So this prohibits us from talking about taboos. The editor has a commitment to support working mothers that would shame many Western companies. 
I brought up my children in this very office. They did their homework around this desk. At times, they have fallen off the desks, but I'm sure this has a big influence on their characters. Now they have grown up, they are confident, self-sufficient, and independent young women. This is all due to the fact that they grew up watching me as a career woman, taking life seriously and making it happen. Senior journalist Roya Karim Magd is shrewdly working the system, pressing for more rights for women. This, remember, is a country where a woman was stoned to death for adultery only the year before. Today, Roya is covering a story about getting compensation for the relatives of murder victims, blood money. She's off to see an ayatollah in Khom, Iran's holiest city. So you all ready with your chador in your hand? Oh, yeah. Thank you. I decided to tag along. As we came into the holy city of Khom, I felt a genuine chill in my heart. Every single woman was wearing the full chador, the tent-like veil. I wasn't going to be an exception. Tehran seemed so liberal in comparison. Every female here appeared a shadow. What must it be like to be a wife or daughter in this city of Ayatollahs, where these men make the codes that govern your life? In principle, the Quran rules that men and women are equal, but so much doctrine seems to reflect male interests, so that on the issue of blood money, families only receive compensation for a male victim. Roya is meeting Ayatollah Yusuf Sani, a prominent liberal thinker. She is hoping to get a sympathetic fatwa, a directive that will give women the same right as men. What made you start this debate on the subject of blood money for men and women? I personally have researched hundreds of subjects in the past. About 30, 35 years ago, I talked about women judges. I used to shout in the holy city of Qom that women can become judges, and now I'm saying a woman can choose any kind of work and there is no religious boundary. Let's imagine that a father has killed his daughter. In such a case, there is no retaliation. He has to be imprisoned and pay blood money. So how would the Ayatollah justify equal compensation for women? Any doctrine that is contrary to the spirit of Quran is not credible. Remember that there are plenty of verses in the Quran that refer to justice, and one of the bases of Islam is justice. So I have compared this doctrine with the Quran and realized that they are not based on justice, and therefore I have rejected them. And he said that all things between men and women are equal. It's very important that for the first time one of these ayatollahs can mm -hmm. say these things. He's an and little by little man. we can change many things in Iran. And it's very good for us. It's very good for us. This was a scoop for Roya. And as Ayatollah Sani was heading for the door, I wondered if he had equally progressive opinions on the age of girls' puberty. In Iran, it is the only country where, at the age of nine, um, a girl becomes a woman. And I wondered if the, um, the clerics are thinking whether that should change. A girl's age of puberty is 13, not nine. That's when a girl is obliged to say her prayers and fast. I've been saying this for 10 or 12 years. 70% of the girls start their periods and become women at the age of 13. There are exceptions that are dependent on environmental and geographical factors. If a girl gets her period at the age of 9 or 10 and her appearance changes, she becomes a woman. But in the majority of cases, it's 13. This flexibility and frankness from a senior cleric was a surprise to me. It suggests that a return to the purer teachings of the Quran potentially allows for far more modern and egalitarian thought than you would guess from the Islamic fundamentalism that is so much talked about. Many Iranian women say they've found independence within Islam. 
they have got on with their lives, whatever the Islamic requirements of the state, headscarves are no excuse for not keeping fit. But others are angry and impatient. Now there is evidence that a new generation is taking to the streets, burning their hijabs and chanting, no Taliban in Tehran. Yet in the very next country to Iran, the hijab is at the center of an equally violent argument, but for very different reasons. In fact, the exact opposite. In Turkey, women are also taking to the streets. The difference is these women are fighting for the right to wear the veil, not to burn it. I've always had this fascination with Turkey because it seems to be a country which did a kind of Islamic revolution in reverse. And since the 20s, it's had this whole emphasis on separating Islam from the state. For 500 years, Istanbul was the heart of the Ottoman Empire. After its defeat in the First World War, Turkey's leaders decided that Islam was anti-modern and reactionary. In the Muslim world, there had been no period comparable to the English Enlightenment two centuries earlier, in which church and state were separated. But now, Turkey, alone in Islam, took that step, under the leadership of Kemal Ataturk, who pursued an aggressive policy of separating religion from government. He replaced Turkey's Arabic script with the Roman alphabet. He decreed that Turks should dress in Western clothing. He banned the hijab and the fez, and to set an example, presented his own wife with her hair daringly exposed. But you don't have to be in Istanbul for long to realize that Islam is still planted firmly in the lives of ordinary people. It's Ramadan, and it seems the whole city is waiting for the muezzin's call to end the fast. It's coming up to um, 20 to 5, and everyone's waiting for sunset, and everyone's just waiting until the time to eat. Some of them are buying it in advance, but people are just waiting, patiently waiting, until that moment when they would all sit and eat together. Here in the open air, some women choose to cover their heads. But if they were in any public building, as civil servants or students, the hijab would be forbidden. The state is terrified of the political symbolism of the veil. But for many girls brought up in traditional families, the hijab is a required public display of their faith. I met up with Hadija, a medical student, and her friends who've been banned from Istanbul University. They invited me to their flat to tell me what had happened to them. Hadija claimed that their fathers were told they'd lose their jobs if their daughters kept their scarves on in their ID photos. They said, if you don't give this, these photographs, we will uh, take your fathers out of their jobs. Really, yes, they threatened they, your they father? Treat, they treat all of us. One day, we saw a paper on the doors. We saw some of papers. Mm -hmm. It's written that you mustn't come like that with a scarf. Oh. If you come, mm -hmm. we will give you punishments. We will punish you. Uh, the first punishment was warning. They warned us. They said, you are behaving undignified. They said, you are disturbing the other students. Yes. They say, you terrorist. You are bad students. One day they would see, we are not uh, so dangerous. But they were still seen as a threat and suspended from their studies. Hadija and her friends say they weren't interested in politics before the hijab ban. Now they find themselves drawn towards causes such as Palestine and Chechnya. Surely this is the very thing the Turkish government feared. Coming away from meeting those girls, their families and they have really struggled um, to kind of come to the big city and transform their lives by trying to become doctors or nurses or going to university. And it seems just particularly shocking that the state is going to such extremes to persecute them.
secularization may give us in the West the freedom to experiment and live independent lives, but when Western culture is imposed on Islamic societies, they can experience it as being as alien to their way of life as Islam would feel if it were imposed on Britain. The government's hijab ban was introduced in 1998 because Muslim practices had been creeping back into the workplace. People have since been forbidden to pray at work. As a result, a lot of women, like the medical students, have lost their places at university or their jobs for defying this ban. Finding herself in this position, Tuba Akuz set up a support organization to help other women. This tells the whole story, and I want to show you that. This is a photograph from 1995 or 6. We've graduated from our schools. Then this band made us so we became so... Look like militants. Yeah, these people are angry. Does it create a kind of political activism in women who are being yeah. marginalised this I way? I mean, th this is very simple. If you force someone, if you suppress someone, you make her marginalised. Uh, it doesn't hurt anyone. But they say that by staying there with your hijab, you're imposing your worldview. But you, unhijabed woman, you also have a worldview and you're also imposing it to me. They are claiming that you are dividing the society by your hijabs, but it wasn't so. And I hope they can understand this before costing so many people's lives. This is a really human rights issue. Turkey is in a dilemma. It is a secular democracy, but by wearing the hijab, many women are challenging the secular state. Others, also good Muslims, say it's perfectly possible to separate religion and the state. In fact, it's more important now than ever. I'm going now to meet a journalist who stood in the recent elections on a very pro-secular ticket. She's campaigned a great deal on the importance of keeping things like this hijab ban. And in a sense, she's the person I want to ask about the they. You know, who are these people who seem so afraid of the hijab? What is it about the state that feels so under threat from Islam when ordinary Turkish people seem to have no fear and no problem at all? If you ask my personal idea, do I like the headscarf? And as a feminist, um, I, I will say no, I don't like it. And why? Because I think it's against freedom of the body. The hijab somehow is, is a problem. And I'm wondering why, why that think, should matter. You know, hijab is uh, not the biggest problem, no. of course. I think it's a minor problem of a bigger problem, which is how do we uh, put Islam and democracy together? Because, uh, as you know, uh, maybe better than me, Islam is, uh, is a, a religion which is organizing your daily life. You cannot, in a Muslim country, you cannot have democracy if you then don't have secularism. Because if Islam is going to rule our daily lives, then you cannot have democracy. You're saying it's impossible to have um, an Islamic state that is democratic. I want to live with the European uh, standards of democracy in my country, which I think that they, these are the highest standards of democracy. Now, unfortunately, my country has become a test area for Islamic democracy. And I'm, I don't feel very happy about it. Zainab, herself a Muslim, fears men, mullahs, are lurking behind the hijab issue. She fears an Iranian-style reintegration of religion with the state. But ironically, by refusing to tolerate Islamic practices, her party is going against the will of the majority. It is not democratic. The trouble is that the hijab is used as a symbol by politicians and revolutionary movements for their own purposes. It can be interpreted as progressive or as reactionary. In the 2002 elections, the overtly Islamic AK Party won power, and of course on their agenda is the right for women to wear the hijab. But the first thing that strikes you when you meet their spokeswoman is that she chooses not to wear the hijab. Since we've been in Istanbul, we've met um, a lot of 
um, women who've lost their jobs or lost their place at college or university because they want to wear the hijab and they've been told they're not allowed to. Um, will your party have any plans to change that? When the state is offering a service to the public, it cannot discriminate between its citizens on grounds of language, sex, religion or race. It wouldn't be fair, and our constitution provides free education for everyone. So it would be a typical human rights violation not to allow students to attend school because of this problem. Do you think it will be hard to change the way so many state institutions at the moment refuse to allow women these freedoms? Is that something difficult to change? National consensus is very important on this issue. According to two surveys, between 60 and 70 percent of women in Turkey cover their heads, in line with their beliefs. This is too big a percentage to ignore. You cannot conduct politics as if women do not exist. The test for Nimet Gubakai's AK Party, now in government, is whether they will tolerate the secular as well as the Islamic. Up to now, the modern Turkish state has been terrified of the political symbolism of the veil because they fear religious fundamentalism taking over Turkey. The irony is that it's the secular state that has come to be seen as oppressive, denying religious freedom. If Islam is going to meet the challenge of peaceful coexistence with other cultures, other religions, then this is where it faces one of its most severe tests. Malaysia's population is a little over 50% Muslim. It's a hodgepodge of ethnic and religious minorities, Chinese, Hindu and Christian. Kuala Lumpur is a noisy, hedonistic city, not a mullah in sight. Malaysia's governing party is Muslim, and though it's widely seen as corrupt by the voters, it runs a genuinely secular multicultural society. But I'm heading upriver to the north of the Malay Peninsula and a world away from the capital. is Kalantan, the heartland of an Islamic fundamentalist party that is now the official opposition. The party Islam Say Malaysia, PAS for short, has been in power here on and off for 30 years. From the moment you arrive here, there is no mistaking that you are now entering a re-Islamicized zone. This billboard I noticed the other day, at first I thought it was like a, a specially taken photo, the mother and the daughter wearing hijabs. And then I realised getting closer in daylight that someone has carefully painted on the hijabs. And they've even chosen different colours for the mother and the daughter, and they've painted on shadows. So actually at a distance, it just looks like it's real. First glance, just a very modern supermarket. 
but one of the laws that PAS has brought in is separate queuing for men and women. And they've got different aisles. They've got five for women and um, one, three for men. I was wondering what, um, you know, when couples come shopping together, which aisle, aisle they choose. There are women in the men's aisle, and there are definitely men in the women's aisle. So I think people here just seem to be ignoring it. It's eerie, almost unique in Southeast Asia. Here, there's no karaoke, no public entertainment. Every woman I see is wearing the hijab. It's compulsory for Muslims. This is the rule of Paz, a party led by a man who says women in skimpy clothes are the main cause of social ills and decadence. A man who wishes to introduce the stricter form of the Sharia law. The women I've met knuckle under this hijab law, but Nick Aziz tries to pass it off as no big deal. It seems to me that women here all choose to wear the hijab anyway. I'm just interested as to why you feel there's a necessity to legislate if most people without any compulsion, which is surely the way of Allah, without compulsion, have chosen to, to live that way. Yang kedua masalah undang-undang ni, kami tak buat lagi sekarang. Undang-undang kalau orang buka tudung tu kena undang-undang, kami tak buat. We haven't enforced it. We've only implemented a minor regulation or bylaw. Even if we enforce it, not everyone would listen. Not all human beings listen to good advice. There are some who are resistant and only want to listen to evil. That is why we prefer to use advice. There is a concern that you see women as being morally weaker and, in a sense, the um, women are responsible for men's behaviour. Everything which could lead to adultery has to be banned. That's why we close down discos and nightclubs to curb the possibility of committing adultery, abandon babies and rapes. I consider a woman's voice as part of her aura and her clothing as well. Women's clothing to me is very important because a woman who is wearing the hijab won't attract men's attention. But even I, myself, as a man, can get easily aroused and lust after a woman without hijab. If a man sees a woman who exposes her body, it is very hard for him to contain himself. That's why we have banned women from singing and wearing clothing that exposes the body. In nightclubs, there is singing. Men can easily mix with the women, take drugs, hugging each other, rapes. Could you tell me, is this a good place or what? His voice is gentle, his words shocking. The problem, he believes, is women's sexuality and men's lack of self-control. And while Nick Aziz struck me as devout, he clearly believes people can't be trusted to make their own moral choices. This market is named after Khadija, the Prophet's first wife, who was a successful businesswoman, as are these women of Kelantan. In fact, 80% of the businesses in Kelantan are run by women. But the Islamist rule of Paz is beginning to make life difficult. Norizan Yusuf's hotel business was thriving, but in September 2001, the Paz party put a ban on all live music and even some traditional dances. I'm trying to understand how Paz party's ban on certain kinds of entertainment like this traditional dance, has it affected you and your business at all? Actually, I'm not quite happy for this ban uh, entertainment. I'm not quite happy for my, for my business, especially my hotel. I'm not quite happy for this role, party, past party. Brave of Norizan to say that in public. But she herself is a devout Muslim, and her family have never questioned their faith. Like most people in Kalantan, it's part of their daily life. They don't need the draconian enforcement of the Paz party. Mm -hmm. 
So why do people vote for this party? Poverty is only part of the story. Nick Aziz's Islamic revivalism is attractive because it's seen as uncorrupt. In Kelantan, as in so many other places across the world, radical Islam has taken the place of Marxism. But there is real opposition to the fundamentalists, and it comes from fellow Muslims. Sisters in Islam are a pressure group who combine the vigor of Western feminism with practical Malay Islam. They distribute simple leaflets to ordinary women on what Islam says about polygamy or domestic violence, complete with quotes from the Quran and phone numbers for the police. I went to meet Zaina Anwar, one of the founding members, another devout Muslim woman who says she won't allow her religion to be hijacked. The Islam that I grew up with is no longer here. <laughs> Really? <laughs> you know, yeah, because of the discrimination that women suffered, um, you know, problems in getting a divorce, getting maintenance, issue of polygamy, domestic violence. And most of the time, when they go to seek for redress to their grievances, they're told that this is Islam. But when we went back to the Quran and read the verses in the Quran, it was very, very clear that the Quran talks about justice, about equality, about compassion in the relationship between men and women. I cannot accept an Islam that is unjust. Well, I'm interested, you said you grew up with a very progressive Islam and you feel that's disappeared. How has that yeah. happened? If you look at pictures of Muslim women in party politics in the 1950s, 1960s, you just see black hair everywhere. No one was in a hijab. But all this became issues with, you know, Islamic revivalism that engulfed the country starting from the 70s. Suddenly you're told that as a woman you need to cover up. Um, you're told that, you know, it's dangerous to mix with non-Muslims, you know, because they're infidels who might lead you astray. And the idea that my mother who, you know, did not wear the hijab is burning in hell because she never covered her head is something that I just cannot accept. Since 2001, Sisters in Islam have had a real fight on their hands. The Paz Party are trying to get the strict Sharia penal code onto the statute book, including the amputation of hands and feet for theft and stoning to death for adultery. Laws and policies are being made in the name of Islam, you know, that are regressive. Person are taking away um, rights that have been granted to women in the past. These laws are basically non-enforceable, you know, or if they are enforced, they will violate the federal constitution in terms of fundamental liberties and in terms of equality before the law, because who are being targeted? You know, it's this kind of uh, less privileged, less empowered women who are being targeted under these laws. Leaving Malaysia, it seemed that strong Muslim women like Zaina Anwar were the country's best chance of not succumbing to the fundamentalists. Women are drawn to Islam because it gives them a strong sense of identity and enriches them spiritually in a material world. It's an identity Islamists define as inherently political. But some Muslim women are prepared to challenge that, to say that there is a way of reconciling Islam with modernity and the West, and to do that, they're brave enough to take on the mullahs. If many in the West see Islam as backward, one reason is the practice known as female circumcision or genital mutilation, excising the clitoris of young girls. In Egypt, it's thought 97% of married women have been mutilated in this way. Although now illegal, a recent feature film made headlines for showing what still goes on. Based on a true story, the film is about a schoolgirl who gets pregnant and gives birth alone. When taken to hospital, a Muslim surgeon decides to treat the girl for her promiscuity by illegally removing her clitoris. This cruelty is regularly defended by Muslim clerics, who often say it's Islamic. I spoke to one conservative sheikh, Dr. Abdul Sabur Shaheen. He was full of enthusiasm for the practice. Circumcision is an act of compassion. 
towards the woman. It's a way of honoring her rather than disfiguring her. It is necessary when the woman has a long clitoris. That is why it is reduced. Reduction helps because the long clitoris is a discomfort to the women when she is walking in the street. So it is the norm to reduce the organ proportionately rather than eliminate it entirely. But just a few minutes later, Dr. Shaheen changed tack to say that it was really all about sex. It prevails in rural communities because of the need to protect the girl. If it stays long, she is in a state of extreme sexual excitement. No one can deny this. So it is done to stop the girl from being wayward. After that, she can get married and satisfy her sexual desires legitimately in a proper Islamic way. Dr. Shaheen is only one of several Muslim scholars who justify the practice of what they call female circumcision, actually an African tradition found throughout the Nile Valley. The director of this film, Magdi Ali, based the story on his own experiences working in a hospital as a pharmacologist. I try, for, for example, for this circumcision to say that it's not Islamic. But they don't believe me. In the film, if you notice, the, the, the woman says that the prophet never makes circumc circumcision to his daughters. So this is a, a, a marvelous proof, proof that it's not Islamic. What this is really all about is the conflict over age-old traditions in a culture where, especially outside the big city, men are used to controlling women. It may not look like much, but this busy women's clinic in Cairo is a front line in that fight. Dr. Mawaheb El Mueli's patients are from poor, rural, and mostly very strict Islamic families. And she tells them that there's nothing in Islam to justify female genital mutilation. Female circumcision has nothing to do with religion. It's been there for, for ages and ages, even pre-Islamic, even pre-Christianity. And our Christians, as well as the Muslims, do it. In many cases, uh, tradition is mistaken for religion. Islam has some instructions, of course, for women. But unfortunately, religious leaders tend to control women by not revealing the whole facts about Quran. But the good thing is that women's attitude towards circumcising their daughters is changing. In 1997, the Egyptian government made female genital mutilation illegal, but it continues to be carried out in backstreet surgeries and even middle-class private clinics. One of the biggest problems for me has been discovering how much that seems to be negative in practice doesn't have any source in the Quran. It's all from the Hadiths. It's the sayings ascribed to the Prophet that were written down um, many years after his death. And even scholars agree there are some which are more questionable than others. One of the issues which is never mentioned in the Quran is um, the idea of a female genital mutilation. But there is one Hadith which um, has a reference to a woman who apparently carried out such practices coming to the Prophet and asking him about it. And he is supposed to have said, if you must cut, then cut gently or cut lightly, um, because it is more pleasing for the man. Now, some have said, well, it means that you are allowed to cut, even if the Prophet isn't actively encouraging it. But there is no reference to it in the Quran, and there's certainly no idea that it's advocated. And yet, in places like Egypt, it is still normal for nearly all Muslim women, and it's considered appropriate and part of their, their modesty. If female genital mutilation is slowly on the retreat in Egypt, it is because women are challenging the old traditions using the religious texts themselves. 
Cairo's Al-Azhar University and Mosque is considered to be the highest seat of learning for Islamic scholars, the world authority on Quranic interpretation. At the women's faculty, I found young, confident Muslims taking an active part in the debate about the future of their religion, unlike their mothers who were excluded from religious study. They study literature in Arabic, uh, medicine, but they didn't study religion. Prophet Muhammad say, Islam muamala, which means Islam is how to deal with people. That's what we are learning. In fact, that's the one thing that I think we should be basically concerned with. It's um, correcting the, the image of the highly disfigured image of women um, abroad. These young women reject Western values, but they also reject many of the practices which they and their mothers were brought up to believe were Islamic. Seeing them now as just the result of a culture in which men policed female behavior. If we started this uh, talking and this conversation yeah. with foreigners, I think we could have prevented many bad things to happen. Women in Islam are, are being educated. Um, they get a chance at building a highly reputable career. They, they, they earn their own money, and they have their own standing and their own position on difference of worldwide problems. So why think of them as less in any way from women all over the world? And I think that's our mission, mainly to simply show the true face of Islam. We see in Saudi Arabia, women cannot drive a car or cannot vote. That's what they say is Islamic, but that's not true here. I just wondered if you have an opinion about that. Everything in Islam is allowed, unless this thing is forbidden by a verse or by a perfect hadith. Everything is allowed, unless this thing are circled by kind of rules. If I am kept inside this circle, so I can do whatever I like. These students at Al-Azhar are genuinely committed and they know their holy texts in detail. I imagine they'd have no trouble holding their ground against male fundamentalists. I don't know if they'd call it feminism, but that's what it looks like to me. There is a new generation of Islamic scholars who are happy to call themselves both feminists and fundamentalists because they return to the original text of the Quran to regain for women the status they enjoyed in early Islam. Dr. Zainab Radwan specializes in Sharia Islamic law. The Quran has every if there is no specific instruction about something in the Quran, you have the right to apply your own knowledge in order to put it in context and arrive at whatever interpretation is of greatest benefit to the community. The aims of the Sharia are to relieve hardship and to enable people to enjoy life within the boundaries of whatever is in the best public interest. It may be that stricter practitioners wouldn't agree with my interpretation. They would argue that a literal reading is the only way forward for the survival of Islam in our society today. Well, I don't agree with that strict stance. In every Islamic society, there are liberals and conservatives. The concept of chastity has all but disappeared in the West, but it's fundamental to Islam. Sex outside marriage is forbidden for men too, but in practice it's women who carry the burden of maintaining their honor. Young couples try to get round this by using the concept of urfi, unregistered marriage. It means secret, and it's hugely controversial in Islam, because marriage is supposed to be public. In Urfi, a couple agree to be married in secret, giving them a kind of indulgence to have sex without, they believe, offending Allah. The Urfi marriage is very common among the Egyptian youth. And of course, I think, I think that it's good, you know? And it's not really uh, haram, it's not forbidden, really. And I think it's the only way the youth can 
uh, respect themselves because they think that this, this is uh, good with Allah. Yeah? And at the same time, they, you know, fulfill that kind of desire they can't stand, you know. Do you think that youth is going to wait until 35 or 40 years of old just to start the living? We met couples who'd entered into an Urfi marriage, many of them students falling in love for the first time, but none of them would go on camera to talk about it. In the West, premarital sex is no longer taboo, but from the stories I was hearing, when Urfi marriages break down, the boy often denies they were ever married, and the girl is left with her reputation in tatters. So what does the Quran actually say about the idea of an unregistered marriage? There's um, a verse in Surah 24, verse 33. Let those who find not the wherewithal for marriage keep themselves chaste until God gives them means out of his grace, which small few lines, but seems to be saying, if you can't afford a dowry for a proper marriage, you have to wait until you can. The Quran seems pretty clear on that one. So what do young Muslims think? In one of the more sophisticated parts of Cairo, I came across a familiar looking cafe, a theme bar based around the Friends TV series. I mean, this stylish group lounging around inside was surely in favor of loose Urfi style relationships. Not at all. While clearly at ease in Western culture, their loyalty to Islam is uncompromising. You hear about this trend in Egypt, which is earthy marriage. I didn't know if um, you had come across that at all um, no, at it's university. It's not accepted very much. Yeah. It's not accepted at all. No. Because uh, in Islam also you have to celebrate the, the wedding publicly. It's not approved, it's not marriage for us. You know. I mean, you're probably aware, you know, there are moves to get earthy marriage recognized so that women who... Yeah go into one have the right to divorce. I, I don't think it's good for them to, uh, to legalize it because um, uh, it's wrong. So they do it very early, they do it in, when they're in college, they do it when they have uh, no, finance, no income. If she gets pregnant, in most cases, the, the guy <laughs> quits. The problem is for, is for the girl, not for the boy, because uh, her rights are totally destroyed mm -hmm. yani, with this orphan marriage. Parents don't allow, the, yani, they don't want them to marry a certain guy, so they just um, go yani, do this orphan marriage instead of, uh, because, because they the don't get the don't approval like of, their, uh, of their parents. I mean, you obviously don't think orphan marriage is a solution. Mm -hmm. What is the answer then for, for young people like that, whose families don't want them to do what they're doing? They just don't do it. Yeah. Just wait. don't do it. Just wait. <laughs> I think they can have a relationship, a normal relationship, without marriage. Yeah. Like, a boyfriend girlfriend thing. But when you say, um, I mean, in the West, you're probably aware, you know, people have, um, you know, they have a sexual relationship before marriage and there is no stigma about it. Is that what you mean? No. Or, no. no. <laughs> Sex here is not allowed in religion or tradition. So the relationship she means is a kind of uh, friendship. Islam has a poor image in the West when it comes to marriage. Stories of arranged or forced marriages and polygamy abound. But as I was about to find out, when you go back to its roots, it's very firm in its advocacy of women's rights. This is Karachi, Pakistan's most vibrant city. There's a special buzz about it now because it's wedding season and I'm here to attend one. My father grew up here and going to big family weddings was how I spent many of my school holidays. The bride-to-be, Nadia, is at the beauty parlor, putting the finishing touches to her wedding preparations. Nadia is a Sunni Muslim, while her fiancé, Hussein, comes from a more religious Shia family. I wondered what difference that would make to the wedding ceremony. There are lots of things. Some of them are like little things, like once we get married, go back to his parents, and he has to wash the woman's feet and stuff like that. So I mean, you know, little things like they've asked us, okay, so what dressings do you have? And they don't have a problem with us, and we don't have a problem with. You don't have a problem with your husband washing your feet? No. <laughs> I think it'll be fun actually washing. You hear a good deal about arranged marriages in Pakistan. I wondered how she and Hussein got together. We've practically grown up with each other. We were in the same school for like 15 years, but we didn't really know each other. It was only until we went to college. He was in Boston, I was in Chicago. 
and that's where we met in Boston. But in Pakistan, arranged, sometimes forced marriages are still the norm in the poorer, rural parts of the country, as families try to keep control of women's property rights, which are passed on through marriage. Again, it's local custom and culture at work. And on this issue, the Quran is very clear. There is no concept of forced marriage in the Quran, indeed of arranged marriage. It's always assumed that the woman and the man are both giving full consent. She owns her own property and she has her own rights, which have to be respected. O ye who believe, ye are forbidden to inherit women against their will, nor should ye treat them with harshness, that ye may take away part of the dowry you have given them, except where they have been guilty of open lewdness. On the contrary, live with them on a footing of kindness and equity. And amongst the wealthier classes, love marriages, like this one of Hussein and Nadia, are what most young people would aspire to. And later in the Quran, in Surah 30, which deals in more spiritual terms with the, the creations of God. One of the verses is specifically about the amazing creation of marriage and of, of men and women for each other. And among his signs is this, that he created for you mates from among yourselves, that ye may dwell in tranquility with them. And he has put love and mercy between your hearts. Verily in that are signs for those who reflect. <laughs> The evening before Nadia and Hussein's big day, the couple's families put on a big and brash party called a mehendi. It's a kind of hypercharged shower party for the bride and groom and a great opportunity for everyone to let loose on the dance floor. the flowers, uh, the, the fruits and offerings, the ceremonies, the dancing, the henna, it's all Indian, Hindu, Sikh, it could be any of these things. And then you look closer, you see the women in hijabs who are not dancing, who are dressing differently. They don't have a problem with the fact that many other women are wearing incredibly slinky outfits, saris and makeup and so on. The whole scene here is completely at odds with that stereotype that I think now exists in the West of Pakistan as a country that's being sucked into Islamic extremism. Next morning, before Nadia and Hussein's wedding gets underway, I head to the shore where Karachi faces the Arabian Sea. A steady stream of pilgrims are paying their respects at the shrine of a Muslim saint, Abdullah Shah Ghazi, one of the many wandering mystics who spread Islam through the region. The fragrance of the incense and the flowers reminds me of Hindu temples, but of Catholicism too, for these people are praying not to the saint, but through the saint to Allah, prayers of intercession. Baba, for God's sake, you pray to the God for his son. I want his son only. Whatever you like, he will, he will pray to God and God will give you. Then when your wish is completed or it is finished, then you come bring each other or rice. You didn't bring sweets, you got agarbatti. Why? Sweets are necessary. It's assumed that you pray for a son, not a daughter. Islam doesn't seem to have overcome Asian culture that values the male over the female, even though the Quran condemned the devaluing of girls as barbaric. And yet here are Nadia and Hussein, about to tie the knot in a ceremony which places the greatest importance on the woman's genuine consent. The imam, the father and the witnesses have drawn up the wedding contract. The bride, still inside the house, should feel no pressure to go ahead if she's reluctant. She will be asked privately three times if she accepts the marriage. In contrast, the man's acceptance of the right of marriage, intoned by the mullah, is very public. A declaration to his family and friends that he's taken on the responsibilities of a husband. <laughs> 
Nadia has accepted the marriage and now joins her new husband. As Muslims, Hussein and Nadia are required by the Quran to live lives based on kindness and equity. <laughs> and they start life together on the basis of a contract that specifies a woman's material rights in the marriage, something prescribed by Islam more than a thousand years before it was heard of in the West. It remains an integral part of the institution of marriage, and not just for wealthy couples like Nadia and Hussein. Even a couple getting married against the wishes of their parents will sign a pre-marriage contract, in this case, Pakistani style. Odd as it sounds, what always impressed me most about Islamic marriage was the right to divorce. The Quran goes into great detail about divorce. In language that still astounds with its modernity, it acknowledges that marriages can break down and sets out principles to ensure women and children are treated fairly. Nothing in the principle of Islamic marriage is anti-female, but the practice is dominated by the weight of masculine tradition. Many Muslim men are known to use scripture to justify violence against women. The women in this safe house have suffered domestic violence, sexual abuse, and are victims of Pakistan's harsh zina laws, which as part of the strict Sharia law forbid all sex outside marriage. Many of these women's lives are under threat, simply choosing to marry whom they want, or for wanting a divorce from a violent husband. It took a strong woman to set up this shelter two years ago, the first one in Karachi. Majda Rizvi is Pakistan's first female high court judge. She saw a desperate need for legal aid and support for these women. Mainly it is the mindset which you can say the patriarchal society. Because people think they don't accept women as their equal. When it comes to our rights, Islam is not there. When it comes to our duties, Islam is there. But of course it takes time. People have changed and hopefully they will further change a better prospects for women, I think. I got married in 92, and since then, my husband hasn't earned a penny. Actually, my marriage wasn't arranged, I was forced. I have five children. One is studying the Quran, one is in school, and the other three are here. My husband didn't beat me, but he couldn't cope with the expense of five children and told me to go back to my parents. I was sold for 20,000 rupees. They bought me forcibly. I wasn't happy about it, but they forced me. Then I had a son and a daughter, and my husband kept me locked up because he was afraid I would run away. Then I became pregnant again. He beat me up and then threw me out.
But what if it's put in writing? Yes, but my daughter's coming of age for marriage. My son is still in school. I can't ruin their lives. In spite of this man beating her and not providing for her, she feels she has to go back to her husband because she's got this young daughter who, who is to be married and that she's got my smaller children who need education. So does the Quran justify beating? Men are the protectors and maintainers of women because God has given the one more strength than the other and because they support them from their means. Therefore the righteous women are devoutly obedient and guard in the husband's absence what God would have them guard. As to those women on whose part ye fear disloyalty and ill conduct, admonish them first, next refuse to share their beds and last beat them lightly. But if they return to obedience, seek not against the means of annoyance, for God is most high, great above you all. When I first read this, recently anyway, it seemed to kind of be the, the heart of the whole kind of feminist debate, you know, do women have to be obedient because men are inherently um, their masters? And in the context of, um, of punishment, rather than seeing it as men have the right to beat women because, you know, women obviously need a bit of a beating, the first thing you should be doing is is trying to reason, it's completely turning on its head um, the attitudes to women of the time and, and talking about treating each other as equals in a way and you know rather than beat up your wives I think it's saying is beating should be the last thing on your mind. <laughs> Islam is anything but puritanical about the business of sex. Unlike Christianity, this is a religion that actually spells out the right to sexual fulfillment of both husband and wife. In Islam, sex is very much for pleasure as well as procreation, and there are verses which talk about the importance of mutual pleasure. In Surah 2, verse 187, permitted to you on the night of the fasts is the approach to your wives. They are your garments, and ye are their garments. There's also a verse which says that if men refuse to sleep with their wives for four months, uh, she's entitled to have a divorce after that period if they're not reconciled. And there are hadiths as well which talk about the importance of a man pleasuring his wife. One of them says... When one of you copulates with his wife, let him not rush away from her, having attained his own climax, until she is satisfied. There's no sense that celibacy is a better state than marriage, quite the contrary, and there's certainly no Eve-like fall from grace. Islam not only allows for human desires, but also requires men to treat their wives fairly. Polygamy is the issue in Islam which seems to cause the most confusion and the most trouble with interpretation. And certainly the Prophet Muhammad did marry many times, but people don't tend to know the context of his marriages. He first married at the age of 25. His wife, Khadija, who was the first convert to Islam, was 40, and she proposed to him. And they were, in fact, monogamous for 25 years. Only after her death did the Prophet marry again, and most of those marriages are seen as being political ones. There was one point in his life when the Prophet wished to take a fifth wife, and the Quran had a limit of four. And at that stage, the Prophet had a, a revelation which made a special dispensation that Prophets were allowed up to five. At that stage in his life, then, he had five wives. Four wives has been the limit ever since. Here in Nigeria, 42% of all married women are in polygamous relationships, not only within Muslim marriages, but as a result of Nigerian pre-Islamic custom. A man can have sex with four women within marriage, but if a woman sleeps with more than one man, that's adultery. But does Islam see that as a matter of private conscience or a crime against God to be punished in the courts? In Nigeria, the stories of women sentenced to be stoned to death for adultery have shocked the world. The argument about enforcing Sharia, the Islamic legal code, goes on. But as yet, no woman has been stoned to death. We're heading up to the far north of Nigeria, to the Muslim state of Sokoto. The signs boast that up here, the Sharia is the law. We've come in search of one of the women sentenced to death for adultery. Her name is Safia. 
After Safia's husband disappeared, she became pregnant by a man called Yakubo. Safia's terrible mistake was to tell her brother, a member of an extreme group of Islamists. Her appeal lawyer takes up the story. Now, from what we were told, her brother, Mohamedou, belongs to a fundamentalist group called the Hizba. And he felt he was doing the right thing by telling them that, oh, my sister, Sophia, my own sister, same mother, same father, is pregnant and she is, she's not married. It's a problem, we have to do something about it. So they went and uh, the Hizbas thought, okay, they have to ask Sophia to explain. Under interrogation, Safia told her brother and his friend about Yakubo. When they came to investigate me, they asked me whether I was pregnant or not. If I failed to tell them, they would take me to Sokoto and put pepper in my eyes. They harassed me and intimidated me. They confused me and I was very surprised about everything. She said, oh, it is one Yakubo that is responsible. And Yakubu was called to court, and from the record, he denied. He said he doesn't even know what they are talking about, because he was forewarned that, you know, if you accept it, you'll be held responsible for adultery and the punishment is turned to death. So Yakubu denied everything and was released. That seems perfectly fair to leading supporters of the Sharia. In Sharia, if you swear, knowing that God knows whatever you have done, and you're willing to swear, and risk the life everlasting in the hereafter. It's your bloody business. We leave you with God. The, the law will let him go, but she will have to be penalized. Safia, meanwhile, was put under arrest and brought before the court. They asked Safia, oh, Safia, you are pregnant without a husband. She said, yes. And they said, do you know that is adultery? She said, OK, if you say so. According to them, that was confession. Since 1998, the penalty for a self-confessed adulterer in Sokoto has been death by stoning. The clearest example of how, for some very strict Muslims, like the General Secretary of the Supreme Sharia Council, religion and the rule of law are one and the same. Sharia to a Muslim who knows his religion is a complete way of life. From cradle to grave, there is prescription for everything you do, how you do it. Islam has been a way of life until the advent of British colonialism. When they came, they deceived our people. They did away with the criminal aspects of Sharia. Then Muslims suddenly realized, I mean, why should we accept their own laws? Why should they impose their own laws? We have ours, which we believe are superior. You understand? So where does this apparently harsh and punitive Sharia law come from? Well, technically it has its source in the Quran, but there's much in modern Sharia law in Islamic states which is not to be found here. For example, there is no punishment of death by stoning for adultery, but there is a punishment of flogging with very strict conditions. And in fact, the same punishment is given for falsely accusing someone of adultery. But Prophet Muhammad saw Islam as the logical conclusion to the Jewish faith, the teachings of the Torah and the teachings of Jesus. And death by stoning for adultery, for example, was in the Torah. And it seems that as different Islamic schools of thought and interpretation and schools of law have developed, these Jewish traditions have gradually become incorporated into Sharia law. Everything about the criminal aspect of the Sharia is contained in the Bible. It, is, it says... Whoever commits the act of homosexuality or sodomy should be punished. You find these condemnations in the law of Moses. So Islam, being part of the Abrahamic tradition, contains these laws. To a Muslim, the Quran is one complete divine injunction, which says if a person commits, for example, fornication or adultery, the law must apply its full course. The trouble is, Sophia told us, in practice, the whole system works against women and allows men off the hook. There's never any evidence against men. It's really very difficult to prove anything against a man. But Allah, the evidence is really with God. 
You see, men really help each other, but it's Allah who knows the truth about everybody. Safia didn't even understand the terminology in the court that condemned her to death. One thing saved her life on appeal. She'd got pregnant a few weeks before the Sharia officially became part of the criminal justice system. For Safia, it has been an ordeal, but for her lover Yakubo, there was justice of a kind. After the sentence was passed, God intervened, and this man who violated Allah's trust and wronged me, three days later he was taken ill and died. The evil that he committed was turned back on him. But the question here is not whether Safia was guilty of adultery, but whether the state has the right to criminalize a person's private life. Safia's lawyer says that for Muslims like her, as with modern Christians and Jews, the answer should be no. My personal opinion is that to a very, very large extent, religion should be separated from state. Um, that's how I feel. And that we should, uh, as much as possible, also allow people to develop the value system and uh, um, give them the opportunity to be as religious as possible but not mix it up with, uh, with politics. Allah protects everybody from this kind of danger. Women should thank God and pray to him to protect them from falling into this kind of situation. May Allah protect us and put us on the right path. Safiya was poor, uneducated had no real idea of the crime she was supposed to have committed. But as I was finding out, she was typical of the kind of woman throughout the Muslim world who was victimized by Sharia law. As in northern Nigeria, Sharia law operates in Pakistan. There has never been any controversy about the imposition of Sharia law in personal and civil matters. It's the imposition of the criminal code that upset people because although the country is 97% Muslim, Pakistan was not established as an Islamic republic. It was set up to be a secular democracy in which not just Muslims, but women in general and other religious minorities should be able to enjoy freedoms. And what's happened over the years is that supposedly Islamic codes of moral behavior have been forced onto a constitution that was never designed to take them. They were imposed more than 20 years ago by the military dictator, General Zia-ul-Haq, who seems to have picked out the nastiest interpretations that justify the ill-treatment of women. They're known as the Hudud Ordinances, and they've been a curse on the women of Pakistan ever since. Here, too, adultery is a criminal offence. The punishment is stoning to death if you're married, a hundred lashes if you're single. But in practice, the death sentence has never been carried out. But many women are no longer prepared to accept this as the word of God. In Islam, there is no priesthood, only scholars, so anyone can interpret the Quran, which is what that brave judge, Majda Rizvi, is doing. She is challenging the mullahs on the Quran in support of the rights of women. My concern mainly is most of these women who are victims of this law, I should say, are from the lower class, you know, they are uneducated women, and yet they are in jail. They haven't done anything wrong, and yet they are being abused. They haven't done anything wrong, and yet they are being raped and, uh, you know, misused and all. So I really feel bad, and my concern is that if we really want to have the Islamic laws, then they should be according to Islamic injunctions and not the law which is badly drafted, which is being abused, misused, misinterpreted, because this is not Islam. So here in Pakistan, as in Egypt and Nigeria, educated women, politicians and lawyers are telling a new generation of young Muslim women to interpret the Quran for themselves. And that's why I tell women, you know, the younger, the women who are being educated, read Quran, read with meanings, try to understand, try to interpret, use your brains, 
and then we can fight with the mullahs because mullahs have no education at all they have learned just a few things and on that the entire village is being governed by them because the villagers are mostly illiterate people and whatever the mullah says they accept it so this is my concern Back in Britain, where we take education for granted, Muslim women are exploring ways of finding liberation by going back to the words of the Quran. The very fact that Britain is not a Muslim country means that they have had to decide on their own what makes a good Muslim, and many believe that's the best way to be. Hey, assalamu alaikum everyone, and welcome to our Rooms Courtship and Marriage event with live comedy from Jeff Reza. This is Clerkenwell in London and a club full of young professionals. Single Muslim professionals attending a courtship and marriage evening. And now you're very attractive looking, if you don't mind me. So I'm finding you strangely attractive. Uh, do you want to come camping? No. Uh... <laughs> These are the British Muslims who don't make headlines. This could be any club in Notting Hill, but it's fruit juice, not alcohol, behind the bar. I like music. Do you like Bhangra music? They are finding a way to live within two different cultures. One of them, Shagufta Yaqub, who edits a Muslim paper, Q News, liberated herself from having an arranged marriage by demonstrating to her family that the Quran says marriage should be freely undertaken and loving. Islamically, I'm not compelled to marry any particular person. I have a right, in fact, if, if my consent is not part of the marriage contract, then the marriage contract's not valid. So I was finding out all these things and finding that Islam was so liberating for a woman. And my parents initially, they just thought, you know, she's sort of going against tradition, but when I actually put the Islamic arguments to them, they couldn't argue with that. Definitely my coming back to Islam had a big part to play in my newfound confidence in, in standing up for my rights. I've recently got a mobile phone, you know, um, on the Al-Qaeda network, you know. <laughs> You get a great reception in caves. <laughs> You'd never guess it from the fundamentalists or from the tabloids, but for these young Muslims, Britain is a surprisingly comfortable and inclusive place to live. People often oppose, like, put Islam in opposition to uh, being British or being American. I don't feel there's a contradiction there. Excessive patriotism, you know, is, is questionable, but loyalty to the land that you live in is, is actually very Islamic, you know, Islamic idea. Islam does come first. You know, I'll be Muslim whether I'm in Britain or America or Pakistan or Egypt or wherever I go, I'll be a Muslim. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm disloyal to this country. It was 55 years ago, you know, the British, they left Pakistan. They said, OK, we are leaving. It is your country now. And what did they say? They said, no, no, we are coming with you. <laughs> How does being a Muslim in Britain feel, you know? How do you think of yourself? How does it affect the way you live and what you do? I think it's one of the best places in the world you can be a Muslim because there's that freedom to express yourself, which you don't necessarily have. Certainly, uh, minorities and even Muslim countries will tell you they don't have that kind of freedom. And, and uh, also, it's not something that's being imposed upon you. So a lot of young British Muslims, you know, they, they choose to be Muslim. But right now, I think asylum seekers are getting a hard time. Have we got any asylum seekers in tonight? <laughs> have you noticed how many Australians are coming over to this country? <laughs> They are taking our jobs. <laughs> they are taking our women. Two Australians have moved in next door to me. They have brought down the price of my house. <laughs> and where I live, that's not easy. <laughs> I knocked on the door. The issue isn't so much, you know, it's Islam versus sort of modern Western modes of behaviour, but it's the lack of sort of innocent spirituality of, of deeply held religion mm. in, in a country like Britain. Mm. The more role models young British Muslims have, the more positive images they see, the more uh, sort of young prog progressive Islam, British Islam that they see, the more likely they are to aspire to that and actually feel that, hang on, we do have something here, we can work, work towards something. And I think many of the problems we face as Muslims in this society are not specifically Muslim or Islamic issues. They're just a general, you know, people who are people of faith, who are still holding on to, you know, deeply spiritual ideas. Leaving the club, I was struck by how successfully these Muslims have combined their faith with their secular principles.
When I began my exploration of the lives of women in Islam, I couldn't understand why so many younger than me were turning to the veil, why public identification as a Muslim was so significant. Having traveled across three continents, what I now understand is that the harsh simplicity of fundamentalism is very often a reaction against the imposition of Western culture, that the old symbols and practices provide self-respect and identity. But what I didn't expect, and what's given me real hope, is the discovery that across the Islamic world, it is modern, free-thinking women who are going back to the Quran to challenge the mullahs and are seeking an interpretation of Islam that works for women in the 21st century. I am confident that they will find it. Inshallah. Hey.